The class was in complete silence, pretending to concentrate on homework. But you could see the nervousness in the air and the stealthy glances at the clock. The children were like a troop of soldiers, ready to go into battle at a signal. However, in this case, it was a war of everyone against everyone. Mary knew that, and she wasn't willing to let anyone beat her. As soon as the bell rang, they all dropped their pens and ran to the door. She was sitting at the nearest table and was the first one out. She had it planned from the day she chose her desk. It was her favorite holiday of the year, after Christmas, of course, and it was worth spending the year in the front row to be the first to arrive in the courtyard. The sun was shining, it was the perfect day. She picked up one of the baskets and went in search of her precious treasure, Easter eggs. Although they were clumsily hidden and there were plenty for everyone, the competition was fierce, and the longer it took, the less there would be left. She heard all around her the joyful cries of those who had already found some, and she got more impatient. She decided on the wisest strategy, splitting up and searching in remote places where there were fewer classmates. Without realizing it, she stepped out of bounds and into the dark grove next to the courtyard. It seemed illogical that there should be eggs hidden so far away, but time was running out and she had only found a couple. She was desperate. Mary could hardly hear the screams of the other kids in the distance, and her footsteps echoed over the ground and the leaves. Suddenly, she noticed other footsteps besides her and turned around. In front of her, there was a big rabbit, as tall as an adult, standing and looking at her. His mouth could be seen despite his costume. Cold, cold, you're going the wrong way. Mary listened to the stranger and retraced her steps, while he followed her. When she reached some stones at the edge of the grove, she smiled confidently and bent down to look. Hot, hot, you're getting close. The rabbit bent down too, very close to her. She finally found a prize, two brightly painted eggs that she kept in her basket. The rabbit smiled through the costume and patted her face. Excellent, now go back to your friends, there's nothing else here. That same night, Mary went to bed later than usual, but she fell asleep right away, worn out from the exhaustion and the chocolate binge. Her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Lynn, were a young couple who knew how important this party was for her, and they let her do anything she wanted. After midnight, when the house was completely silent, something woke Mary up. A hairy hand caressed her face and she opened her eyes. Sitting on the bed next to her was a huge rabbit. She could hardly see him in the dark, but he didn't look the same as that morning. He looked a lot more realistic, his eyes were alive, and he looked at her with a sinister glow. His fur was dirty and messy, and his mouth was much larger, with pointed fangs sticking out. The search is not over yet, little one. There are two more eggs to be found. His voice sounded much hoarser, and she could feel the stench of his breath on her face. Mary was scared. She didn't understand anything, but she decided to listen to him. She got up half asleep and went to the hallway, keeping her eyes on the rabbit. She looked to the side towards her parents' room. Cold, cold, you're going the wrong way. She turned around and walked through the darkness into the living room, leaning against the wall. She noticed something hot and sticky on the wall. There was a trace of liquid that followed down to the bottom, but she couldn't guess what it was. She wiped off her hands on her pajamas and moved on. When she got to the living room, partially illuminated by the light coming in through the windows, she looked around, thinking what would be the best hiding place. She looked at the group of flower pots in the background. Hot, hot, you're getting close, she heard in the distance. As she moved the leaves of the plants aside to check, the light from the window let her see that the liquid in her hands glowed with a scarlet red color. Her intuition had worked once again, and hiding in the corner, she found the two eggs. But they were different from the rest, much larger and roughly painted. They were also covered with a strange layer of hair. She turned one of the eggs with difficulty. It was really heavy. And she discovered, terrified, her mother's face painted on it. Upset, showing horror. It looked crazy, but the blood surrounded it left no doubt. It was her head separated from her body. She didn't need to turn the other one, it was obvious who it belonged to. She rushed instinctively to her parents' room, terrified, and her fears were confirmed. The spooky rabbit was lying on the bed, bent over one of the bodies, devouring its entrails. 
The rabbit turned to Mary with bright eyes and a hot breath coming out of his mouth. See how cold it was here? All right, now it's my turn to find the last egg. It was a warm summer afternoon. Mark, a young man of 25, was on the roof of his apartment. He liked spending long periods of time alone, and on this particular day, he needed it even more. An argument with his girlfriend Beatrice prevented him from concentrating on anything else. As he looked around, he noticed a stock of old newspapers. He opened one of them and began to turn its pages. An event caught his attention. It reported the death of a young man whose body had been found with great signs of violence. His throat had been torn out with some kind of claws and they also found a mark on the forehead. After reading the strange event, he felt a knot in his stomach. Mark looked down the street, his eyes fixed on the people coming and going, until suddenly a man caught his eye. Although it was summer and the temperature was pleasant, he was dressed in white gloves and a long black jacket with a hood, along with a striking black and white striped scarf. At one point, the man stopped and looked up, as if aware of his presence. When the young man saw his face, his blood ran cold. He wore a mask, half white and half black, with a strange and macabre smile. Suddenly, the expression on the mask changed, and he smiled more wickedly now. The figure cocked his head, and in just a few seconds, the mysterious figure climbed up the building and began to climb the wall with his bare hands, which were now strong claws with long nails. Mark freaked out and backed away from the edge, running for the exit. He ran without looking back and slammed the door behind him. He could hear his chilling voice in the distance. Do you want to play? <laughs> I want you to play. But Mark was already running to take refuge in his apartment, panicked. Upon reaching his room, he fell into bed, doubting if what he had seen was real or not. When he managed to calm down, exhaustion took over him, and soon he closed his eyes and fell asleep. The next day, he woke up confused, vaguely remembering the events of the previous evening. It was probably a dream, I'm sure it was my imagination. When he regained his composure, he remembered the discussion with Beatrice and decided to visit her to ask for her forgiveness and make peace. But before he faces the situation, he should steal himself. He went to the kitchen and rummaged in one of the cupboards until he found a bottle of wine. He opened it and poured some into a glass, but when he raised the glass to his lips, he realized it was water. He glared at the bottle and suddenly a familiar laugh broke the silence. Would you like a glass of wine? <laughs> Mark jumped, spilling the contents of the glass. Without waiting for more, he fled the apartment in a hurry and went to his girlfriend's house. He was very nervous and he had a bad feeling. Arriving at the entrance, he knocked on the door but no one answered. He called again but with the same result. Desperate, he tried to turn the knob and the door gave way. Inside, everything seemed in order. He strode into the kitchen, calling Beatrice's name, but there was no answer. He went to the dining room, where he found an open bottle of wine on the table, the same one he had in his apartment. On the body of the bottle was a note that read, I'm so sorry about our discussion. I'd like to make peace. I love you with all my heart. Mark. The young man swallowed, feeling his heart race. He didn't remember sending her anything, even though the note was signed with his name. He called her again, but again there was only silence. So he decided to go upstairs and investigate the room. But as he went up, an image left him stunned. Beatrice was lying on the floor, cold and completely still, and Mark knew that she was dead. He knelt next to her body and felt the tears welling up in his eyes. Suddenly he felt a presence next to him. It was a strange man with that disgusting mask showing a wicked grin. How sweet of you, he exclaimed. She drank it and then she died. It was poison, <laughs> the strange man yelled, laughing. Mark entered the room where he knew Beatrice kept a gun. He opened a drawer of the nightstand and found a gun. He turned around and the strange man's evil smile greeted him. The wine's out, <laughs> he said mockingly. Mark, blinded by rage, pulled to safety and fired. But the strange man had not only dodged the shot, but climbed onto the wall of the room, climbing up to the ceiling as he had done the day before. 
From up there, he pronounced in a dark voice in an annoyed tone, You're boring. And with a snarl, he lunged at me. <sighs> the police didn't take long to go to Beatrice's apartments after the neighbors called when they heard the shot. They found both bodies, and in a first search, they determined that Mark had poisoned his girlfriend, but they couldn't explain what had happened to him. The body was found in a huge pool of blood. His throat had been slit by strong claws that seemed to belong to some animal. Stains were found on the walls and ceiling of the room, but no evidence confirmed the identity of the culprit. And on Mark's forehead, a mysterious inscription. Tic Tackers, welcome to another Scary Tuesday. Today, we travel to South Korea. There lived a very poor young peasant accompanied by his elderly mother. They had a hut in a remote area of the forest, and although they were very good people, they barely had enough to eat. One midsummer day, with the sun shining brightly, his mother told him that she was looking forward to eating cold noodles in soya or chada. For this dish, he needed ice, so although it was difficult to find it, the young man went in search of it. To do so, he had to cross the town, with such bad luck that on the way, he came across a group of heartless young men. They told him that the only place where he could find ice was in a hidden valley inhabited by ghosts and spirits. The young man, eager to fulfill his mother's whims, set out to go. When he arrived, it was already dark. He could only see what the moon allowed him to see. And suddenly, he came upon a scene he wished he had never seen. A nine-tailed vixen was staring at a man's liver. He was alive and trying to defend himself, but the animal's teeth clamped down hard. The young man could not help but let out a scream of terror, which startled the fox who quickly ran to meet him. He, very frightened, knelt down and begged her to let him live. He explained that he had gone there for the sole purpose of finding eyes for his old mother. This moved the animal, who made him promise that he could not tell anyone about what he had seen and would let him go. The young man accepted the deal and was able to get home safe and sound. After a few months, he managed to find love in a young woman he met in the forest. She stayed with him and his mother, and together they had two daughters. But they were so poor that the girls barely had enough to eat. After the birth of the second one, the woman began to behave strangely. Every night, she would disappear until the early hours of the morning and come back with pearls of great value. With the proceeds from selling them in the market, the family left hunger behind and welcomed comfort. The man was intrigued by the origin of the pearls, but he decided not to ask questions and even encouraged his wife to go out to look for them. But one day, she came home with a major wound. It was from an arrow, and it almost cost her her life. He, in desperation, tried to distract her by telling her the story of the nine-tailed fox he had seen years before. But before he could finish speaking, she let out a terrible scream and transformed into a fox. In a weak voice, she managed to say to him, Ten years ago, tomorrow, we met. If he had kept the secret until then, I would have become a woman forever. But there is no turning back now. At that moment, she grabbed her two little girls and left for good. Today, we want to tell you about the Korean legend of the Kumijo. Its literal translation is Nine-Tailed Fox, and this already gives us a lot of information about what we're going to talk about. Nine-tailed foxes are common in folklore originating in Korea, China, and Japan. According to these legends, it is a fox that by living for more than a hundred years can become a spirit and change shape. The most common is that of a beautiful young woman who seduces men and eats their souls. This literally, because this young woman is often represented in the body of a fox devouring the liver or the heart of a man. There are different versions of that legend, but all agree that if the gumijo nature of the fox is discovered by humans, it means the end of their lives. Sometimes they can make deals, and if the human who discovered the gumijo keeps the secret for a specific time, he can keep the human form. This is what he desires most, to become a person. Over time, their representation in the world of culture has grown. 
We have been able to find nine tail foxes in K dramas such as My Girl Farnese a Gumijo, Grudge the Revolt of Gumijo, and Goo Family Book. In a multitude of books, and even in video games such as League of Legends, with the character of Ari, inspired by this figure. Have you ever heard of them, TikTokers? We have been frozen with the image of a young girl devouring a human liver. Adeline had a very difficult life. Her mother and her brothers completely ignored her, and her father didn't stop mistreating her. She had a mental disorder. She was continually accompanied by different voices in her head. The only one in the house who helped her was her brother Jonathan, who often tried to protect her from their father's blows. He did the same thing one day when things got really serious. Her father grabbed her by the neck and was about to kill her. But in the end, he left her saying, it doesn't matter, tomorrow they will come for you. She, without understanding anything, asked her brother why he said that. He tried to cover it up by saying he had no idea. But the next day, the worst forecasts were fulfilled. Two people from the sanatorium went to pick her up. Despite the insistence of her brother, who even hit one of them, and despite her kicks, she was hospitalized at the Black Forest Mental Institution. There, her life was even worse than at home. She felt that every day was the same. She was mistreated and she lived in absolute hell. Her only salvation was the nurse Annalie Grunwald. She never yelled at her and also led her favorite activity, sewing. But one day, everything changed. While she was lying in her bed, she heard that in the next room, the chief of his staff was yelling for everyone to get up. She ignored it and continued for a while longer, but suddenly she appeared in her room and threatened to get up. The voice in her head told her to hit her, but once again, she steeled herself and obeyed. That day, on the way to the cafe, she saw a strange character in the forest. He had no face, but he communicated with her. He told her that when she could, she should go meet him. She knew from the other patients in the sanatorium that escaping from there was impossible. So she just put her head down and kept walking. That day, Nurse Annalie was very sad and Adeline noticed. She learned that the reason was precisely her. From the direction of the center, they had decided that the little girl's illness was incurable. And that's why they wanted to put her to sleep forever. Kill her. But Annalie loved her too much and she wasn't going to allow it, so she suggested running away. She would help her meet her brother in the woods. That same night, the nurse distracted the doctor so that Adeline could go out the side door. They succeeded, but they didn't think that the gardener would come out the shed just then and catch her. He warned everyone while the little girl ran as fast as she could through the forest. In fact, in fear, she didn't stop to look where she was going and suddenly she realized that she was in the middle of the forest. She didn't know where to go until she heard the voice of her invisible friend. This way, little girl. She took a step in that direction but quickly realized that the sanatorium staff were very close. Among them, the chief of staff, that horrible person. She had an axe in her hands, which made her sense that the thing would end fatally. Her strength was failing, but she still ran as fast as she could. Her strange friend was trying to help her by intimidating the stuff, but there were too many of them. And while she was running, Adeline tripped and fell. That caused the chief of his stuff to catch up to her. She begged her that she didn't want to go back to the sanatorium, and the boss told her that she could grant that wish. She raised her axe and brought it down on the little girl's body multiple times. So many times that there was hardly anything left of her. The members accompanying the boss were totally horrified to see what she had done. But what they didn't expect was to turn around and see a huge figure staring at them. When the chief finished her work, she turned so that one of them could hold the axe for her, but all that was found were three bodies hanging from a tree. Right behind her was him, that long, faceless figure. 
He killed her and also all the other workers and patients of the sanatorium. He had witnessed a thousand times the terrible things that happened there. That had to end. He only left one person alive, Nurse Annalie. This one was going to have a new reason to live, Adeline. The estranged man brought her back to life. Now she was like a ragdoll, with many seams, but alive. Madeline had just returned from her trip to Boston. She was really exhausted after so many hours of flying, but she wanted to see her friends. She wanted to tell them how the past few weeks had been. She had arranged to meet them at 9.30 p.m. for dinner at her favorite pizza place. Then they would spend the whole night at Aaron's house, watching horror movies and eating popcorn. When she arrived at the pizzeria, none of them were there. She called Aaron, but he wasn't answering the phone. Were they going to leave me at the last minute? She thought in disgust. But just then Marta appeared, interrupting her thoughts and bringing a smile to her face. Soon after Aaron arrived, he had left his cell phone charging at home, and that's why he didn't answer Madeline's call. Angel was the last one to show up. He was always late everywhere, so they weren't surprised. It was already past 22 o'clock when they went inside and started to eat dinner, and the evening went by very quickly with all the young lady's anecdotes. They finished and went to Aaron's house. It was time for a session of the best horror movies, but just as he was about to open the door, no way, I forgot my keys inside the house, and my parents won't be back until tomorrow, Aaron told her, knowing that this spoiled the plan they had for that night. They were not discouraged and began to think about what options they had. It was late, and they had all given notice that they wouldn't be sleeping in, so they wanted to make the most of it. Marta came up with an even creepier idea than the initial one, sneak into the cemetery and spend the night there. Everyone thought it was a great plan. It was close by and really scary. It was already past midnight when they arrived. Everything was absolutely silent and the wind was blowing strongly. The big gate that closed the entrance prevented them from passing, but they managed to enter the cemetery. At that moment, they knew they would not be able to leave until the next morning. From inside, the wall was too high, but that was no problem. They wanted to spend the whole night. There, the atmosphere was heavy. The cold dominated the place, and the sinister tombstones seemed to haunt them. They wandered for hours, trying to scare each other and playing jokes. They were starting to get bored, but Madeline had an idea to increase the tension. They would leave their cell phones on a large statue in the center of the cemetery, divide into two groups, and return to that spot at sunrise. They all agreed. Aaron and Madeline left on one side, Angel and Martha in the other. The wind was getting stronger and stronger, so Madeline suggested taking shelter in a pantheon. She was starting to get tired and cold. It had been a very intense day. They huddled together waiting for daybreak. In the meantime, Angel decided to play a joke on Marta. He told her to look at the strange inscription on a tombstone. When she got lost trying to read it, he left quietly so he could scare her in the dark. Marta realized she was alone. Stop it, it's not funny, she reproached him, but no one answered her and she began to get nervous. Suddenly she heard a noise, as if two stone slabs were moving. Angel, stop, she shouted. Again, she got no response. She looked everywhere for his friend, but he was nowhere to be found. At first she thought it was a practical joke, but after a while without finding him, she became overwhelmed. Tears flooded her eyes. The thought of whether something had happened to Angel tormented her, so she decided to return to the meeting point. There was no one there. It was still hours before dawn. She grabbed her cell phone to call for help, but she had no reception. There was nothing she could do. She was locked in that terrifying cemetery. So she simply sat down to wait for the sun to rise and her friends to return. At dawn, Aaron and Madeline returned to the place where they had arranged to meet, but there was still no sign of Angel. He vanished. Marta explained to them what had happened, while she kept crying. They looked for him all over the cemetery, but in vain. They tried to call on the phone to report the disappearance of their friend, but everyone was still without reception. They were locked up, desperate, not knowing if they would ever see him again. It all started in the house of the Tylers, a middle-class family that had a young daughter, Lilith. The girl, despite her young age, had a very strong character. 
She had no friends, but she entertained herself every day with the friends she created in her imagination. One night, the little girl woke up suddenly with a pang in her chest. She looked around and all she saw was a door closing and a shadow walking out. She touched her pajamas and looking at her hand saw that she was covered in blood. She had been stabbed. She tried to scream, but something inside her wouldn't let her. The blood in her chest continued to spill as Lilith felt weaker and weaker until she lost consciousness. When she opened her eyes, she was in her bed, her pajamas clean and the door closed. It had all been a dream. She started to fall asleep again, but when she looked up at the ceiling, two giant eyes were watching her. Suddenly, what appeared to be a woman fell on top of the little girl. Lilith began to scream. That creature was exaggeratedly skinny, had a whitish complexion, had no eyes, and blood gushed from its sockets. It turned its head 360 degrees and laughed in a chilling way. Lilith's father came running to his daughter's room, alerted by her screams. But all he saw was a little girl shrieking as she stared at a fixed point. The girl told him that a monster was going to kill her. But the father, seeing that there was no one, tried to calm her down by telling her that it was just a nightmare. When Lilith fell asleep, her father returned to the room with his wife. He told her that Lilith told him that she saw things. They both stayed talking about the little girl's recent behavior. They were worried. From that day on, Lilith continued to scream every night. She said it wanted to kill her. So they decided to put a hidden camera in the room without the girl noticing. That way, they could understand what was happening to her. After a few hours, the girl woke up agitated. In front of her was that extremely thin woman, showing her sharp teeth full of blood. Then the creature spoke. She introduced herself by saying that her name was Nyx, and she would be her worst nightmare. She took out a knife and brushed the point across the little girl's neck, which immediately began to bleed. At that moment, hearing the girl's screams, the mother entered the room and began to shake her daughter to bring her to her senses. She told her that nothing she was seeing was real, that it was just her imagination. Lilith began to cry uncontrollably. She kept looking at Nyx, who was behind her mother, pointing the knife at her. The girl began to feel dizzy and passed out. Then, her parents carried her in their arms and went quickly to the hospital, but not before grabbing the camera to see what happened. While the father drove, the mother watched the recording. She didn't understand anything. The girl woke up and she was paralyzed seeing something. Later, she began to scream desperately. When they arrived at the hospital, they revived the little girl. As soon as she was stable, a psychiatrist decided to talk to her alone to find out what was happening to her, if she might have a disorder. Lilith repeated over and over again that this woman was looking at her, that she wanted to see her suffer. The professionals decided to hospitalize her for a couple of days to study her case. On the first night, everything seemed normal. Lilith slept hugging a teddy bear, while psychiatrists and psychologists looked at her through a mirror glass. Suddenly, the little girl began to feel very cold, but there was no one and nothing around her. A light came on in the middle of the darkness. There was a version of Lilith with 19 years. It was a mirror and she was a teenager. She had two color hair and was holding a knife full of blood. The woman in the mirror said, She's here. She's looking at you. While pointing her head at the ceiling. Shortly after, Nyx was a stroke in her hair while laughing in a dark way. Lilith started to tremble, but something inside her wouldn't let her scream. Again, the lights came on. And then a nurse entered the room. She held her up and put her back on the bed. Years passed and Lilith lived in a psychiatric facility. Her parents had stopped visiting her. She had no friends. She spent her days locked up inside four walls. The young woman had grown up and was already used to living with Nyx. 
Instead of getting on bad terms with her, she obeyed everything she asked of her. During the day, she kept telling her caregivers that she was there. She was always watching, but nobody listened to her. Until one day, she grabbed a nurse by the neck and broke it in half. Then she went to the kitchen and grabbed a butcher knife with which she killed all the stuff she encountered on her way to the exit. At last, she felt the sunlight on her pale skin again. When she was already on the street, she stole clothes and accessories, dyed her hair as Nick's order so she could be different. And when she realized she was the same girl she saw in the mirror when she was younger. Lilith is now 19 years old and she's still running rampant through the streets, destroying everything in her path. She's looking for her parents so she can give them surprise. Welcome to a new Scary Tuesday TikTokers. Today we bring you an urban legend that refers to an old Japanese children's game. At first it seems totally innocent, but it hides a creepy origin. The word kagome could be translated as circle, although it also means cage or surround. The rules of the game vary by tradition, although the most popular form is played as follows. One boy is chosen as the Oni, meaning demon or ogre in Japanese, and must sit blindfolded in the middle of a circle made up of the other players. The other children join hands and walk around the Oni while singing the Kagome Kagome song. When the song ends, the Oni speaks the name of the person it thinks is behind him. If correct, that person will go to the center and change their position. If he doesn't, he'll stay in the middle until he does. There are many theories about the origin of this game. Some related to the Japanese mythological tradition. Others say that in the Asuka period, the children of the Imperial House of Japan began to play when they were controlled by the leaders of the Soga clan and were prisoners in the palace and able to leave. However, a terrible origin that dates back to 1942 in the middle of World War II is also circulating on the network, specifically in an orphanage in Shimane. At the time, Nazi officials had used the orphanage to conduct clandestine experiments on children. These experiments consisted of the search for a supposed off switch in the human brain, which, when activated, caused people to slowly age until they died. Nazi scientists believed that if this switch could be located and removed from the brain, the person would become immortal. That is, they wanted to get the formula of eternal life. Many children died before their time because of these interventions in their brains. They were buried in the forest surrounding the orphanage and their names didn't appear in any documentation. However, after several attempts, they managed to intervene on a girl, removing the area they were looking for and managing to revive her after the operation. When she woke up, everything seemed normal. So, given the success, they decided to continue operating in the same way with more children. After the interventions, the little ones managed to communicate normally but began to show some strange behavior. They walked the corridors with exaggeratedly smiling and euphoric faces as if they shared a great secret. When one of the children was left alone with a caretaker, his gaze would immediately change, showing a terrible hatred. Then they began to surround several of them, singing Kagome Kagome. They surrounded the caretaker in a circle and stared at him with monstrous faces, terrifying them. At the end of the war, when the scientists and doctors left the orphanage, one of the caretakers left his testimony, stating that those children approached him and asked him to play the game. Their faces were so horrifying that he turned around and ran out of the building. Legend has it that the orphanage is still standing today and that the children are still alive inside, but they're not ghosts. They are condemned to live forever after the surgical interventions of the doctors. They assure that many have dared to enter the building and that they never managed to escape from there. This time, we go back to creepypastas with a new story. Dr. Smiley, a character created by Bond Stream and whose story we have adapted for you. My name is Dr. Smiley, but don't get it mixed up. I'm not an ordinary doctor. 
Unlike my fellow professionals who do their best to cheat death, I cannot relegate myself to something so vulgar. In return, I receive it with a warm hug and help my patients do the same. I like to select them carefully. I follow them and study their behavior before taking the step. I had been following a fascinating young woman with an empty gaze for some time. I was sure she would be an exemplary patient. It was her deep, dark backs under her eyes and her expression of exhaustion that greeted me when I met her in an alley on the way home. I only needed to stand in front of her and smile. I grabbed her hand and kissed it. I will help you, I said. I saw a flash of hope appear in her empty gaze and I knew immediately that she would follow me. She did. We walked hand in hand to my office located in an old block of buildings on the outskirts. Nobody would say that there was a health clinic there. But for me, it was my workplace and a second home. Here, I held my patients, tired of their own existence, to accept death. We went up in silence to the fifth floor, the last one. I opened the door and invited her in with the same smile as before. We went inside and then I closed the door behind us. Ah, there's nothing like home. I invited her to sit on the big sofa in the living room while I went to the kitchen for two glasses of water. I needed to enjoy that moment alone. You didn't need to be in front of her to perceive her nervousness and hear her heart race. After filling the second glass, I calmly returned to the living room. I found her sitting down. She was finally showing some kind of expression on her face. What's the matter, dear? I asked her as I offered her one of the glasses and sat across from her. The young woman turned pale and pointed behind me. I didn't need to look back to know what she was pointing at. Huh, that? Don't worry, there are remains of an emergency operation. Sometimes things get complicated. Her eyes looked at me curiously for a moment, but soon they dimmed as before. I was both amazed and fascinated by how little life they had. But enough talking. I got up and took her hand again, leading her this time to my operation room, slightly lit by an emergency light. Even though she could barely see, I knew every inch of the room. So showing off my best manners, I guided her to the stretcher in the center of the room. She got on it automatically. At that moment, I went back to the entrance and turned on the light. I waited for her reaction. What is that? She said in horror as she pointed to one of the shelves full of jars. That, my dear, are samples of my patients. The last one resisted a lot while I was catting her. Later I discovered that she had a strange disease that made her blood cells die, so her body had turned off. I saw terror on her face. The young woman sat up straight on the stretcher and tried to escape, but she had given me time to get my strange ready. One should always be prepared at work. I grabbed her tight and stabbed her in the neck, injecting the drug. Shh, don't be afraid. I'm here to help you. I whispered in her ear. The girl wanted to scream, but her body had already fallen asleep. Submerged in a deep sleep, I settled her again on the stretcher. I was finally able to prepare for surgery. I was impatient, but I had to do things right. First, I tied her hands and feet. Patient safety always comes first. Then, I took the case with the medical instruments out of the closet. I put them on the surgical trolley and placed it next to the stretcher. As I put on my gloves and mask, I heard her complain. <coughs> I turned around with a kind smile on my face. Welcome back, sleepyhead, I said as I selected the scalpel. The young woman gradually regained consciousness and began to writhe more and more, as my smile faded. That disgusted me. Couldn't she see that I was trying to help her face death? Was no one going to thank me for my work or my kindness? Nah, no, of course not. I raised the scalpel angrily and stabbed her violently in the stomach. I started rummaging inside her as she writhed and squealed in pain. I like to keep the patient alive while I examine them. It's much more fun to see how the organs continue to function even when exposed. 
and I always tried to make them feel comfortable, but I didn't feel like treating her well after so much disdain from her. After opening her stomach and kidney, she finally stopped moving, and I got bored. I cut a small piece from her insides and dropped it into a jar. A new sample from my collection, I thought with a smile. I looked at her face. Her eyes were wide open and blood draped from her mouth. I stifled a giggle. The face they put on at the end is always very funny. I sighed and proceeded to remove my gloves while thinking. Another successful operation. It all started when Tommy asked Marcus to stay with him after class. Everyone had already left the school, except for them. They headed to an empty classroom, and Marcus was really nervous. He was afraid of getting locked in there, but his friend asked him to please join him, saying it was something really important. They went into the classroom and sat on the floor. Then from his backpack, Tommy took out a wooden board and a glass. A few seconds later, Marcus got really tense when he realized it was a Ouija table. You remember Andrea? asked Tommy. Andrea was a student who died just a few months before. Her passing affected everyone in town, since she was found drowned in a lake in the early morning. Authorities declared that it was an accident, but for many, it was very strange that she would be in a lake so late at night and completely alone. Tommy and Andrea had something together. They never called each other boyfriend and girlfriend, but shared a relationship which went beyond being just friends. Come on, Tommy. You're not saying you want to use a Ouija board to contact her, are you? Asked Marcus in fear. I... I have to. I have to know what happened. And you're my best friend. There's nobody else I can ask for help. Marcus gulped and placed his index finger on the edge of the glass. His friend did the same, and they started the ritual by making several questions. Shortly after, they felt how a cold wind invaded the classroom, and the glass started to move on its own, stopping at particular letters. With his free hand, Tommy wrote on a notebook all the words that were being spelled. Together, they read the first phrase, Make him leave. Who should leave? They didn't know what that meant. Tommy asked out loud, and the glass started to move letter by letter again, spelling the name Marcus. Dumbfounded, Tommy asked out loud what was the reason. This time, the word spelled was jealousy. Why is Andrea saying that? Were you jealous of her? What was going on with you and her? Asked Tommy to Marcus. Marcus angrily got up, saying that he was messing with Tommy by moving the glass himself. He also said he'd never been jealous of him nor Andrea, that he didn't care about either. Marcus then grabbed his backpack and left the classroom slamming the door. The next morning, there was an ambulance and two police cars in front of the school. A janitor found Tommy's dead body in the classroom, covered in blood. He was stabbed several times with his own pencil. Marcus said that Tommy stayed in the classroom when he left, talking to Andrea through the Ouija board, but nobody believed him. The police, after checking the school's security cameras, saw how the two friends went into the classroom and how Marcus came out alone, looking really angry. Marcus claimed he did not kill his friend, that he was angry at him, and that's why he slammed the door. He also claimed that it was Andrea who made it look like he was the killer. After many interrogations, Marcus was declared guilty and was sent to a juvenile prison. Later on, Marcus claimed to hear Andrea's spirit every day tormenting him and mocking him. She would never forgive him for killing her that night at the lake. My life was extremely boring. I would limit myself to going to class, being at home, and sometimes skateboarding with my friends. For many, this kind of life doesn't sound so bad. But for a long time, I was looking for a hobby that would entertain me like nothing ever had before. Something that would truly hook me in, you know? I tried judo classes, soccer tournaments, and reading different books, but none of that was engaging enough for me. Then, a friend of mine suggested that I tried out a few video games. I tried Among Us and Fall Guys since they were pretty popular at the time. They were okay, but they didn't hook me in like I wanted. Then another friend told me, hey, why don't you try Roblox? To be honest, I had no idea what that was. I read about it and learned that it's basically a platform with many different video games in it, and that you can even create your own. That friend recommended I tried making a game there, but trying to design a game from scratch and make it actually good wasn't what I was looking for. That said, I had nothing to lose by just trying out the games in the platform. That interested me more. I went into the website, created my username, and as soon as I logged in, the first thing I did was create my avatar. 
I was surprised at the time I spent building my in-game character. It really flew by, and I loved the end result. Then I checked the website, and there I discovered that you could exchange messages with other players, as well as collect in-game currency called Robux. That's when I decided to start playing one of the games there. I clicked on the Games tab, and I felt a bit overwhelmed, since there were just so many games. After browsing for a bit, I found one that caught my attention titled Adopt Me. It looked very childish, but I enjoyed creating my avatar so much that I felt like playing a slice-of-life role-playing game. And so, when I made up my mind, I jumped right in. As soon as the game started, I had to decorate my house with the items I had available. I'd love to live in a house like that, and not just because I decorated it. I didn't know exactly how the game worked, so I spent a few minutes walking outside the house. There was so much stuff in that game, it was really well done, and people wouldn't stop inviting me to different birthday parties, although for some strange reason, most of them would end up getting cancelled. During that walk, I discovered one of the most important parts of the game, the place where I could obtain my first egg. For those who are unfamiliar, pets in Roblox come from eggs, and I really wanted to get one. For a while, I had to take care of my egg and satisfy all of its basic needs. I worked really hard taking care of it, and the hours would fly by due to how much fun I was having. And eventually my first pet was finally born. I felt so happy with my creation that I couldn't stop thinking about raising more pets. During that time, I interacted with another player who was offering me more valuable pets for a bit of money. But to be honest, for the first few days I didn't accept his offers. I enjoyed the feeling of working hard to get my rewards. However, the more pets I was getting, the more pets I wanted. And so, one day, I decided to negotiate with him. He told me he would need my parents' credit card numbers to charge the price of the pets to the card, and then he would transfer the pets to me. I told him I would think about it. I didn't want to lie to my parents, and they would never give me permission to do something like that anyways. But I couldn't help myself. I grabbed my mother's purse and took out her credit card. I gave the credit card numbers to the other player, and he gave me a couple of pets in exchange although they weren't as valuable or as special as I expected. And the next day, everything went south. I started to receive threatening messages. They were telling me that they had cloned my parents' credit card, and if I didn't do everything they said, they would max out their card and ruin them financially. I felt horrible, especially because I couldn't refuse. And now, my life is a living hell. I can't sleep. Those people frequently order me to intimidate other children in my city and help them steal from those children. And every time I tell them to leave me alone, they threaten not only to ruin my parents, but to kill them as well. I'll never be able to get out of Roblox again. Can anybody help me? From Venezuela comes the legend of the Sayona. She is the specter of a woman dressed in white who appears to punish the infidelities of men. Her history dates back to colonial times. Since then, testimonies of countless encounters with this being have been read. Legend has it that a beautiful woman named Casilda lived in the Venezuelan Llanos. She stood out for her amazing beauty and her long black hair. She had married a well-liked man in the village who loved and respected her. After a while, they had a son. One more reason for happiness for the couple. In the town, there was a womanizing man who wanted Casilda, despite being married. He spied on her every day as she swam naked in the river. But one day, she saw him. She saw how he looked at her from the bushes, his eyes full of lust. Angry, she turned to the man, yelling, What are you doing here spying on me? The man replied, I'm not spying on you. I came to warn you that your husband is being unfaithful to you. He betrays you with your own mother. She, dead of jealousy, ran to her house where her husband was. Once there, she set fire to the fireplace and remained impassive while her husband and son screamed for help. When the neighbors came to help them, it was already too late and Casilda had escaped. She went to her mother's house, yelling at her for cheating on her with her husband. The disconcerted lady tried to explain that it was a hoax. She ran to the porch of her house, but her daughter reached her and hit her three times in the stomach with a machete. Her mother, lying on the ground, cursed her with the last of her strength. I didn't do anything and I never lied to you, but you have committed the worst of sins. Killing. I condemn you. Sayona, you will be forever. And in the name of God, so be it. 
It is said that from that day on, the ghost of a beautiful woman dressed in a white robe appears to adulterers. She allows men to admire her and flirt with her. She accepts their proposals and takes them to the forest. Once there, she immediately transforms and lets out a long-range scream that makes the hairs of those who hear it stand on end. Her teeth become sharp fangs and her nails become claws. Her hair is ruffled and she breathes fire from her mouth. Men usually go insane or die immediately. Only a few live to tell about it. Other versions say that when she appears before the woman her, she asks them to light a cigarette for her. When doing so, they see her spectral face and many die of fright. If they don't die at that moment, she harasses them by changing shape until she gives them a heart attack. The Sayona has a peculiarity of being able to appear as a dog, a wolf, or as a beautiful woman. Men who know of her existence wear a blessed palm cross. It is said that when he shows it to her, she runs away in terror. Although the Sayona is a popular legend in Venezuela, in Colombia and Mexico there are other versions. In Los Llanos de Colombia, it is said that it was a woman who destroyed the sacred clothing of a priest, and God condemned her to live in hunger forever. Her name in life was Sarona. She was very beautiful and attractive. However, inexplicably, her face changed and became deformed and her eyes and teeth enlarged. When her brother saw her in this appearance, he tried to say her name before she devoured him. He said Sayona instead of Sarona, which would explain her name. From that moment on, she travels through lonely places late at night, conquering drunken men and then devouring them. Colombians assure that to protect themselves from this spectrum, black animals such as dogs and cats as well as tobacco are good. On the other hand, in the city of Villa Vicencio, Mexico, she is known as the Sayana. It is very similar to the Venezuelan legend, but this time she finds out about the false rumor of her husband's infidelity through the gossip of the people. Sayana not only appears before male victims. Above all, she makes her appearance before the people who spread false rumors, because they were the ones to blame for destroying her life and that of her family. As you can see, there are several versions of the Sayona, but they all share her thirst for revenge. As many Venezuelan women warn, it is better for men to think twice before cheating on their women, or Sayona will appear to them. Welcome to a new Scary Tuesday TikTokers. Today, we bring you one of the creepy pastas that you have asked us the most. Yo-Yo Cartoon Girl. It was created by Shen Comics and later adapted by Trevor Henderson. Yo-Yo was a normal girl, but she had no friends. All the boys in her area avoided her and didn't want to play with her, which made the little girl very depressed. Shut herself up more and more in her house. To distract herself, she began to pass the time drawing in her room. She drew pictures of everything that was happening around her, and little by little, she lost her mind. She hated her life, and she hated everyone who had made her feel this sad. One day, from the window, she saw several children playing. She was very angry. She couldn't understand why they didn't want to play with her. She wanted to hurt them, just as they were causing her. So she grabbed one of her drawings, the one of a yellow bear, used it as a mask and went out into the street. When she appeared in front of the children, she began to yell at them like a bear to scare them. However, they paid no attention to her and decided to ignore her. The girl got even angrier. She pulled a knife out of her clothes and rushed at them. The children screamed and ran away, but she would not give up. She followed each one and brutally killed them. Something had changed in Yo-Yo. She was no longer the same girl as before. Her bare face became permanent. She covered her hands from inside her dress and became Yo-Yo Cartoon Girl. She never returned home. She dedicated herself to wandering around all the places where there were children playing to attack and kill them. She hated them and she didn't want any of them to be happy. 
two descriptions of this creature have been reported. In the first appearances, Yo-Yo had the appearance of a human body with the face of a cartoon bear, with two large cartoonish eyes. She was wearing a long dress with some flowers and socks on her feet. In other appearances, Yo-Yo presented another form that turned out to be that of a true demon. Her bear mask had lost color. It was more black than yellow. The eyes had become two large black holes. The mouth had sharp teeth and a creepy grin. In this form, she no longer hid her hands, but instead, she stretched out her arms and showed her hands with three clawed fingers. Her dress was shorter, revealing her legs. Today's Yo-Yo lives in forests and abandoned buildings. When she sees a child alone, she growls and attacks him like a bear. But she no longer only attacks children, but also adults traveling alone. However, there is a way to avoid being attacked. When she confronts her victim, she reaches out for a handshake. If the person gets scared and starts running and screaming, Yo-Yo will kill them on the spot. However, if the person stands their ground and gives her the handshake, Yo-Yo Cartoon Girl will allow him to escape. What would you do if you found her? A long time ago, in a small Bolivian town lived a couple, Maria and Rufino. They had been together for several years and wanted to get married, but they didn't have enough money. For this reason, Rufino decided to accept a job offer in Argentina and ask his girlfriend to wait for him. He would come back with savings so he could offer her a better life. The goodbye was very sad. Between kisses and tears, the young people made promises of eternal love. Maria assured him that she would wait for him. However, days and months passed and she didn't hear from him. She didn't know if he was alive or dead or if he had even remade his life with another person. During that time, a neighbor of the town had fallen in love with her and followed her everywhere. She rejected him several times, but little by little, she changed her mind. A year had passed and she hadn't heard from Rufino. She still had no money and her new suitor could help her change her life. So finally, she agreed to be her partner and they got engaged. On the day of the wedding, Rufino showed up at the church. He had come back to be with Maria. She froze when she saw him. She felt a mix between fear, happiness and confusion that wouldn't let her move from where she was. When Rufino saw that his girlfriend was with someone else, fury blinded him and without saying a word, he took off the axe he was hiding behind his body and made a clean cut on her neck. The woman's head fell to the ground as blood fell on the wedding dress. All the guests were horrified at that scene. Some say that Rufino was imprisoned and others that he fled and was never seen again in the area. Maria's new husband decided to leave the town and move to another city in order to forget that moment. Years passed and the church where the event had taken place was demolished and a school was built. One night, the concierge in charge of surveillance stated that she had seen a woman dressed as a bride, without a head, wandering through the corridors of the building. At first, people thought she was crazy, but little by little, teachers and students confessed to being witnesses of the same apparition. It is said that at dusk, the headless bride can be seen through the windows and even heard crying. Maria's soul is still in pain for having betrayed her true love. In the United States, we find another version of this ghost. In Yellowstone National Park, the headless bride torments tourists. This spirit bears similarities to the Llorona, because she was also betrayed by her husband. Legend has it that a couple went on a trip to Yellowstone. The woman asked her husband where the money they had saved was. He had spent it all on bets a few days before, but he didn't want to admit it, so he reacted defensively by telling her he didn't know where it was. The woman knew the truth and she kept insisting so that he would confess. Then, the man got so angry that in a fit of rage, he hit her and decapitated her, fleeing after the place. It is said that since then, a headless woman in white can be seen crying around Yellowstone National Park. Did you know any of these two versions, TikTokers? Lika Chan, also known as Rika Chan, is a popular series of dolls introduced to Japan in 1967 by the Takara Company. 
She is as well known in Japan as Barbie is in the US. In fact, she was nicknamed the Japanese Barbie. This doll is still sold today, although many of you may not know the urban legend that exists around her. It is said that years ago, the Lika factory released a series with a bug. The dolls had three legs instead of two. In addition, the extra leg was in the middle as if it were an animal hoof. The workers didn't realize it at the time because it was impossible for them to check the thousands of units they manufactured per day. That's how those dolls arrived at the stores with a deformity in their appearance. Many parents of boys and girls who loved Lika Chan took her and when they opened the box, the little ones ended up crying in fear. Most of them ended up in garbage containers and those that found a home became cursed toys. This legend has many versions, but the most popular tells that the three-legged doll waited for their owners in the bathroom. And with a knife in hand, she challenged them to play hide-and-seek with her. Akiko had received one of those special dolls. She had kept her for several years. She hadn't cared about her third leg. For her, she had been even more special for being different. Time was passing and Akiko grew. Her parents had asked her to clean the attic and donate everything she no longer needed. This is how she met her Lika doll again, 10 years later, inside the toy chest. She still had the box. In that edition, the company had opened a telephone line in which Lika Chan herself answered the calls. As she had grown older, she now understood that those messages were pre-recorded, but in her childhood, she loved to call her and imagine that it was her special three-legged doll that answered. She felt a great nostalgia, so she wrote down the number in her hand and decided to go down to the living room and test if that line was still active. She grabbed the phone and heard that familiar voice. Hi, I'm Lika Chan. Thanks for your call. Now, I'm at home getting ready to go out. She hung up feeling a bit childish. She decided to call the number again. Hi, I'm Lika Chan. Thanks for your call. I'm already leaving. Akiko was excited to see that the messages were different, so she called a third time. Hi, I'm Lika Chan. Thanks for your call. I'm coming to the room. How to the room? The young woman wondered. She felt nervous and uncomfortable because it was the place where she was. This situation was causing her fear. She dropped the phone and squatted down to the door of the room when suddenly the phone began to ring. The young woman approached trembling and with a broken voice asked who it was. Hi, I'm Lika Chan. Thanks for your call. I am behind you. Today, we'll share with you one of the most famous ones, the legend of Akamanto. This legend is so ingrained in Japanese pop culture that it has appeared in many different manga, books and movies, gaining popularity even in other countries. It's the horrifying story of a female spirit who dwells in the last toilet of the women's restroom. If you bump into her, you need to be careful with the toilet paper you choose, because that could be the very last thing you do. Her name means red cloak in Japanese, and its origin is difficult to pinpoint. The first images of this character appeared at the beginning of the 20th century in the middle of the Showa era, Japan's era of enlightenment. Around 1935, they said that a very handsome young man, wandering around covered in a red cloak, used to hide in the lockers of Osaka's elementary schools. Later on, in 1940, the legend transformed the man into a vampire who terrified the neighbors at a neighborhood in Tokyo. Over the years, it became vague if the figure was a man or a woman. Until the 80s, when the legend started getting popular again among young people and was then given the figure of a woman. The legend then became that Akumanto was a student when she was alive, subject to constant humiliation by her classmates. And once dead, her goal became getting revenge on the rest of the world for the humiliation she had to endure in her school's restroom. However, why did this legend become popular among Japanese students? Well, because of the bloody game that Akumanto subjects her victims to. This spirit will always look for the person at the last toilet of the line, and the legend says that once you're finished doing your business, a sinister voice will ask you, red or blue paper. After asking this, two rolls of toilet paper of those colors will appear. 
And we're sorry, but there is no right answer. Choosing any of them will lead to a horrible and painful death. If you choose the right one, a commando will appear and will tear out your neck skin. She will do it little by little so you can feel the pain while you bleed to death. That's why the roll is red. And if you choose the blue roll instead, she will grab your neck too, but will strangulate you slowly until your face becomes blue. Other versions of the legend say that if you choose blue, Akamanta will cut off your legs and you will slowly bleed to death. In any case, your suffering is assured. If for any reason you decide to say a different color, a hole beneath you will open towards some kind of underworld where white hands will grab and drag you into the absolute darkness. And if you can't speak or decide not to respond, time will stop around you and you will be eternally trapped in the restroom. Trying to escape or running away will not work either. If you try, Akamanto will materialize before you, blocking the exit and also ending your life. Trying to avoid her will be futile since they say that when she appears, the restroom becomes completely blocked in an alternate dimension from which it's impossible to get out. It seems useless trying to escape such a horrible apparition. Akamanto has a clear objective of ending the lives of his victims and will stop at nothing to achieve her ends. That said, a few sources say that it is possible to save yourself. For instance, some say that if you calmly respond by saying that you don't need any paper, then there will be a small possibility that Akamanto will spare your life, depending on the mood she's in at the moment. Others also claim that if you answer that you want yellow paper, the spirit will spare your life, but will then shove your head into the toilet as revenge. That is a less painful destiny, but a pretty nasty one nonetheless. In any case, TikTokers, remember that if you ever go into a public restroom in Japan, it's best to never use the last toilet of the line. Who knows what might be waiting for you in there? Vine was a nine-year-old boy. He was fascinated by his father's work. He created dolls of all shapes and sizes. Everybody wanted one of those toys that were so perfect and realistic. Sometimes he even created dolls the size of a child. Best of all, each doll was unique, as they were made by hand one by one. One day, a wealthy man named Gear asked for a life-size doll. After speaking with him, the doll maker refused to create it, discovering that he had intentions that he didn't like. At his refusal, the rich man became furious and swore revenge on him. Gear ordered several gunmen to get rid of the doll maker, and they set his house on fire while he and his son were inside. With much effort, the man managed to save Vine from the flames and get him out, but he didn't have the same luck. The little boy was terrified to see how his father died burning before his eyes, while in the background the house turned into rubble and ashes. He asked for help, but it was too late. His father had died of burns. When the firefighters managed to put out the fire, Vine went into the house to see if there was still anything left that had survived the fire. There, he found hundreds of pieces of charred plastic. The dolls that her father had so lovingly created were now melted down and disfigured, with hideous faces that caused dread. He wanted to take something, so he grabbed the only thing that had been saved, a pink glass eye. He took it in his hands and held it close to his heart. Tears began to fall down his face. He couldn't believe that glass was the only object he had left of his father. But unfortunately, the terrors were not over for him yet. Gear ordered his hitman to return to the crime scene to make sure the doll maker was dead. Next to the house, they saw the police, the fireman, and a stretcher with a covered body in the ambulance. Verifying that the man was dead, they prepared to return, until something made them stop. Vine, the son, was still alive. They took advantage of a moment when the little boy was alone and out of sight of the agents to kidnap him and take him to his boss. 
Gear decided to keep the child to replace the doll he never received. He kept Vine hidden in his house for three years as his prisoner. He treated and talked to him as if he were an object. Day after day, the young boy was used like a doll and slowly his mind began to deteriorate and he lost his sanity. One night, Vine decided that he couldn't take this situation anymore. While Gear was in bed, he grabbed a pan from the nightstand and began stabbing him in the neck. Blood gushed from the hole, spattering the walls and floor. Vine, at his young age, had just killed a man. Without being seen by the surveillance of the house, he stole some money and managed to escape. He wanted to start his father's business again. He wanted to be the new doll maker. With his stolen money, he bought the pieces that his father bought and tried to imitate what he had seen for years, managing to make beautiful dolls. With the money he earned, he created more and better ones. But his obsession with making them more and more real grew so much that plastic and porcelain were no longer enough for him. Shortly after, a teenage girl was found sitting on a bench, dead. Her name was Emily Ryder. She was wearing a handmade dress. Her hair had been shaved off and replaced with a blue one, sewn to her head. Her lips were painted and stitched at the corners to form a long smile, and her eyes had been replaced with glass ones. Her body was positioned like a doll on display, with all joints broken. Emily was just the first. Vine had lost his mind. He wanted to be like his dolls, so he gouged out one of his eyes and replaced it with the pink glass eye he had found in the fire. Then, he wanted to sew up his mouth, but he only managed to get halfway. The police still haven't managed to catch him. He is now the new doll maker. The Squid Game had become very famous in the fishing village of Dorland. The children played in the schoolyard to perform challenges similar to Korean fiction. Such was the boom that an organization decided to set up its own Squid Games. They called the press and with many sponsors that would promote the competition, they got a good sum of money to offer as a reward to the winner. The Dorland Squid Games would become a tourist attraction throughout the country. People from the town and from distant places signed up. The only public information was the reward. The contestants hadn't received any guidelines or rules. They only knew that the game would be tough. Sarah had lost her father a few days after being fired from her job. Letters from the bank threatened to take the house away from her if she continued to fail to pay the bills. She fell drowned, so she risked playing the games of her town. It was a perfect opportunity to quickly achieve economic stability. When she got to the beach, she saw hundreds of people wearing green sportswear with their identification number. It was a good replica of the series. There were even hired people with red holsters and their faces covered with fake guns pointed. She was surprised at the realism of acting and decoration. In the sea was the famous doll from the game Red Light Green Light. They had built it the same way. It was gigantic. The water was up to its ankles, though the tide was starting to come in, so its knees would soon be wet. After several photos and videos, the people dressed in red asked all those not participating in the games to leave the area. Both the press and the onlookers were barred from the maritime area, preventing anyone other than the participants from seeing what was happening there. Soon, a voice sounded through a megaphone explaining the rules of the Squid Games. Everyone would have to proceed with their hands and feet tied with various obstacles on the beach and while the tide was coming in. The goal was to get the doll. The first to get it would take the money. The voice changed to a mocking tone and assured that no one would take care if someone stumbled into a trap or a hole. The game started and the tide was already closer to their feet. Sarah advanced carefully, trying to avoid obstacles and keep her balance. She was going slowly, but she knew it was wiser to go slowly and avoid falling. After a few steps, several contestants were already on the ground, crawling like a snake trying to get up. When the sea water reached their knees, the difficulties began. Each jump was more unstable. Some people fell next to her. They were yelling for help. They couldn't stand up and were drowning. People dressed in red looked at them menacingly from boats. If she helped any of those people, she might fall, plus she would lose the chance to win the money. 
She felt selfish, but they had all gone to win the reward. People fell in front of her. They screamed with all their might, but no one saved them. Those responsible remained massive while all those people who were drowning before their eyes. Who had allowed that game? Sarah managed to reach the finish line. One of those in charge of Red put her in the boat with him and they sailed together towards the open sea. She was scared. That had stopped seeming professional to her. The people in charge of that game seemed like real criminals. Soon the boat came to meet a submarine. A person in a red cover came out of the hatch and silently threw a sports back at Sarah. The organizer who was with her on the boat got into the submarine with his partner and raising his hand said goodbye to the young woman, leaving her alone and with the bag in the middle of the sea. Opening the zipper, she found thousands of bills. There was a million or some. Days later, the newspapers reported the hundreds of deaths that had occurred at the Dorland Games. Everything seemed to indicate that a drug trafficking gang had organized the games to evacuate the entire sea area of the town and carry out one of the largest transports of substances in history without police surveillance. In Sarah, she preferred to be left for dead. That money and her could not go back to Dorland together. It is said that the Bombedo is a rather short, stocky, and attractive being, with hairy hands and feet that prevent his footsteps from being heard. He looks ragged and often wears a straw hat and a bag over his shoulder. He lives in the woods or in abandoned houses. He walks at night, traveling everywhere. He announces his presence with a high-pitched whistle in the middle of the silent night. Also, if you hear the birds chirping when the sun goes down, it is a way of knowing that the Bombedo is very close. It is said that if his whistle is imitated, the bombero can answer in a maddening way. In order not to offend him, you should never whistle late at night or say his name out loud, because this makes him angry. He will take revenge by bothering. He is normally a mischievous goblin full of witticisms. He can do little misdeeds like letting animals out of the pen, stealing eggs or scaring horses, but he can also become very dangerous. He likes to throw stones and scare people to death. He can make himself invisible when he wants and let himself be felt by a touch of his hairy hands, which produce a deep chill. He can also slip through the narrowest spaces, go through a keyhole, run on all fours, imitate the song of birds, especially nocturnal ones, the hissing of men and snakes, and the howling of animals. The bombero can become your best friend or your worst enemy, depending on how we behave. The person who wants to have him on his side has to make offerings of tobacco, honey, or cane. Generally, people who work in the fields ask him for favors such as making crops grow abundantly or taking care of farm animals. But you have to be careful, after asking him for a favor, you must never forget to make the same offering every night for 30 days. Because if you forget, you will awaken his fury. If the bombero becomes your enemy, you are exposed to innumerable dangers within the forest, because it will always try to trick us into getting lost in the thicket. Sometimes he causes a strange and dangerous accidents inside the ranches. Although mother versions usually speak of the short bombero, there are also stories of the bombero genius protector of birds in the jungle, who was presented to hunting children as a very tall and thin man. What all the legends agree on is that the main functions of the bombero is to take care of the mountains and wild animals. This spirit of the forest gets angry if any hunter kills more prey than he will consume. If that happens, he transforms into any animal or plant and with entanglements induces the culprit to go into the depths of the mountain where he gets lost. In addition, in some places it is known as the person responsible for the birth of extramarital children. The goblin arrives at night at the house where there are women alone, and if they don't give them a cigarette and a little wine, just touching their bellies makes them pregnant. The Pomero has various names depending on the region, such as Cuero Uyara, which means owner of the sun, Caray Fiare, lord of the night, Pomberito, Pirawe, hairy feet, Cho Pombe. Many witnesses claim to have seen the forest sprite in the present day. Remember that you shouldn't abuse nature if you don't want to make him angry and let him release his wrath against you. And if you make a deal with him, don't forget to keep it. The Three Pascualas legend tells the tragic story of three sisters who fell in love with the same man and the fatal outcome that this caused. 
It is one of the most popular legends in the country, and it is often recalled, especially because it gives its name to the lagoon where the events took place, the Three Pascualas Lagoon. The story takes place in the city of Concepcion, in the center of the country, at the end of the 18th century. The Pascual family lived there, made up of a father and his three daughters, all three of great beauty and who were always very close. They worked as laundresses, so every day they went together to wash clothes in this lagoon near where they lived. Between washing and washing, they sang love songs. In the afternoon, they hung their clothes to dry on the branches of the trees and asked the lagoon to please bring them the true love of their lives. Then they would start their way back to their house with gray piles of clothes tied up on their heads. There are different versions of the legend that explain how the Pascualas came to know the man who was their undoing. The most popular tells that one day he came walking along the shore of the lake and when he saw how beautiful they were, he approached and started a conversation with them. They shared food and chatted until nightfall. He was young and handsome and the three sisters took notice of him. For the first time, they walked home in silence with their thoughts, each convinced that the handsome man had eyes only for her. But he had malicious plans, and he set out to conquer all three sisters at once. For this, he returned to the lagoon day after day, willing to spend time with them and render them one by one. He would arrive in the morning to help the youngest take the clothes to her cabin, and on the way, he would confess his love for her. When the eldest went to buy provisions, he stayed court in the middle one. And while the youngest prepared the food, he gave his love to the oldest. Inevitably, the three sisters fell in love. As each one thought she was the chosen one, she didn't talk about it with the others, so as not to arouse their jealousy. When they washed their clothes in the lake, they no longer sang, they didn't even look at each other. People say that the lagoon was no longer green and clear, but became cloudy and troubled. For his part, the handsome man, upon achieving his purpose, lost interest and stopped visiting them. The three Pascualas waited day after day in vain until they finally looked at each other's faces and realized the deception of which they had been victims. Grief-stricken, they decided to gradually enter the lagoon, looking for their end. At that moment, the waters began to turn into a whirlpool and a tremor shook the bottom. The waters overflowed and when they returned to their course, the lagoon had changed its shape to a waning quarter moon. Since then, the locals say that from time to time, the spirits of the three Pascualas appear in the lagoon, looking for men to cajole to take them to the water and drown them, thus consummating their revenge for what happened to them. Another version of the legend explains that the handsome man was a stranger who came to the Pascual family's house asking for lodging, and they welcomed him. When he returned in the afternoon, he would stare at the Pascualas who sung with their blonde braids in the air and the bundle of clothes from their heads, and he fell madly in love with them. Each of the girls secretly reciprocated his love, and not knowing which of them to choose as his wife, he made an appointment with the three of them on the shore of the lagoon on St. John's Eve. At 12 o'clock at night, the stranger came rowing in a boat, and when he saw the reflection of one of them in the water, he began to call out to her in desperation, Pascuala! Pascuala! Upon hearing her name, each of the three sisters felt that her beloved was calling them and they entered the treacherous waters, but ended up in the depths, drowned. Since then, it is said that every St. John's Eve at 12, a boat appears on the waters, from which the anguished voice of the young man is heard calling the sisters. The story of the three Pascualas is one of the most tragic passion legends which reminds us to what extent one can be a victim of desire and love. Yuki was a young woman who lived in the outskirts of a Japanese town. She was known for her beauty, but also for her reserved and mysterious character. Few knew that Yuki was actually a Rokurokubi. During the day, she spent hours as a human, though at night, her yokai nature flourished. The young woman led a solitary life and hardly interacted with the neighbors. However, one day, a man named Hiroshi moved in next door. He was an inquisitive man and soon found himself intrigued by Yuki's enigmatic beauty. They spoke on several occasions and a connection began between the two. As they got to know each other better, Yuki struggled to control her transformation into Rakurokubi overnight. However, it became more and more difficult to handle the situation and her transformation became more frequent and intense. 
One day, Hiroshi began to notice that something was wrong with a young woman. He saw her behaving strangely and noticed her neck craning slightly at times. Perhaps it had been an optical illusion, but his doubts made him investigate and he found the name of a yokai. Still doubting if he could be facing some kind of demon, instead of walking away, Hiroshi became even more obsessed with Yuki and her supernatural nature. One night, he decided to follow her and that's when he saw her while she was transforming. He watched her stealthily as her neck stretched out and moved in search of her next prey. Horrified, he discovered that Yuki was murdering people in the town overnight. He tried to run away, but the yokai who knew he had been discovered chased after him with its long neck outstretched, emitting a blood-curling scream. Hiroshi ran, but the Rokurokubi caught up with him and strangled him, leaving a terrible death stamp. Since then, it is said that the town where Hiroshi lived is controlled by this terrible Japanese yokai, and those who dare to approach it at night can hear the screams and see the twisted and monstrous figure of Yuki lurking. Today, we bring you the Rokurokubi, a type of Japanese yokai. There are two different types those that can completely separate their heads from their body and those that stretch their necks out enormously. The latter, although their body doesn't move, their head can move by stretching their neck to great lengths as if it were a snake. In addition, it can also change its face to that of a horrible oni to scare even more. During the day, they look like normal women. They often go unnoticed and even have deadly partners. Some are so used to leading a human life that they try to keep their secret. It is said that there are some Rokurokubi who don't know their terrible nature, believing that they are human and that their nocturnal transformations are nightmares. They remember seeing the room or other places from another strange angle thinking that they're bad dreams, without realizing that their head has really been traveling in search of victims. At night, they show their supernatural nature. It is said that this type of yokai attacks in the dark, scares, and not only that, it also drinks the blood of humans. In addition, it has been pointed out that they have a strange fascination for drinking the oil from the lamps. To hide their yokai status, those with knowledge of their transformation sometimes wear scarves and turtlenecks to hide their appearance. According to legend, these creatures die if they don't return to their body before sunrise. So, one way to kill them is to destroy the rest of their body or hide it so they can't find it in time. Did you know this terrible creature from Japanese folklore? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode!